Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and I'll call this meeting to order. I, I see that uh, we have all board members present, and we're going to start the meeting with the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. I want to uh, just announce one ongoing public comment that we've had ongoing since last year, actually, and that is the ongoing public comment period for those who want to comment on the potential next agreement that we uh, have with the federal government and CMMI on an all-payer model. As I've said before, the governor and AHS are leading those negotiations so that so any comments we receive, we will be sharing with our partners at AHS and the governor's office. I also want to let folks know that our March schedule is up on our calendar um, under the public meeting, under the meeting section. You'll see a press release that um, outlines the schedule we have put forth for the month. And that is all I have to announce today. I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, February 16th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, February 16th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. Next on the agenda is a discussion on the Essential Health Benefits Benchmark uh, Plan. And we've had uh, a few meetings to discuss this. And I do know that uh, Emily is on the line in case uh, board members have further discussions, but I just wanted to open it up for uh, board discussion and a possible um, board uh, vote. So board members, do you have questions or comments on the essential health benefits benchmark? I can go ahead and start, although I just see Tom just unmuted, so you can go ahead and start if you want, Tom. No, go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll start and finish quickly. I um, This is a difficult one for me because I think oh, we're kind of missing uh, an opportunity that I think that the result that we're, we have a force to vote on is a minimalist result. Um, it's adding a benefit to a plan that we've had that goes back to 2012. And certainly I'm going to, you know, I know I'm going to vote for this because hearing aids are important and I understand that. But I think, you know, there are some other opportunities uh, like what I've outlined in the past having to do with um, diabetes prevention that just you know, I, I really appreciate what the blueprints presentation the other day, but the scale is still very small. They're talking about a budget of 650,000 across the state for all their self-management programs. And that versus having um, uh, diabetes prevention as a benefit in the QHP plan that serves, uh, God, that we got the numbers today, 31,000 people. Um, and you do some math, um, you're looking at millions of dollars in potential savings with the CDC plan. So for me, ramping up that plan as fast as we can makes a lot of sense. But, um, uh, you know, I've, um, I, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, so that's where I'm at. I'm, I'm a reluct reluctant supporter. I don't, I don't think that we've leveraged this opportunity as far as we can. I think that we might have looked um, into it if we had followed the language that the House that and the Senate gave us, which is to align this with our health care reform. We might we might have found. Jesse, you can put yourself on mute. We're hearing Tom's feedback through yours. Thank you, Jess. Go ahead, Tom. Thanks. So we, we might have been able to kind of find find some room to enhance the fixed perspective payments within the benchmark plan uh, and get and get CMS's uh, uh, engagement and support for that. I don't know. I, I, I have to say I don't know what we don't know, but I do know that that the process that has uh, come to to reside with us has been a minimalist process. 
and it's been about adding a benefit to a plan, looking at three or four opportunities, boiling it down to one, an important one. And, uh, you know, but for that benefit, I'd be voting against this. I just don't think it's 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 well done. But that's that's my opinion. I'm voting for it because of the benefit. Uh, hearing aids. Obviously, I, I wear hearing aids, so it's it's one I, I viscerally understand. Um, I, I wouldn't be here with you if I didn't have hearing aids. <laughs> Maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Take away my hearing aids and I'm gone. But, um, you know, uh, so that's that's where I'm at. Um, and I, I am going to write a, a concurring letter because I kind of want to get this out of my system and down on paper. I've been crunching some numbers here that uh, that I think support my case, but um, um, maybe maybe in 2005 uh, uh, we we for the 2005 uh, benchmark uh, plan, uh, you know, CMS has really done the right thing. They've opened this up to states. It, it it wasn't opened up as a benefit enhancement opportunity. Um, we could adopt in other states total benchmark plan. We could uh, adopt portions of another state, um, or we can uh, put together benefits for our own plan. And I, I just don't think that we have aligned the the, the this plan, um, this benchmark plan, with our um, healthcare reform efforts um, as much as we could. And this has been an issue that we've raised. I went back and looked at the minutes for 2020 and 2021, and I've raised this issue uh, just in 2020. Uh, amended a, a proposal I made that uh, that the um, um, non-standard evaluation criteria be aligned with the all-payer model, and Jess amended it to say no, it should be aligned with with our um, uh, healthcare reform uh, program, and that uh, we all agreed to that. So it's an issue that's been there, and uh, it's one I tried to kind of breathe some life into, but uh, it's not happening, and. So uh, that's it. Thank you for thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you, Tom. Hey, uh, Other board members. I'll go ahead. Um, I am supportive of the approach that Diva suggested, including the addition of uh, the hearing aids benefit um, to the benchmark plan. Uh, I am less, uh, Tom, I'm totally, I actually agree with you around the Blueprint program. I do think that uh, the pre-diabetes prevention has a lot of promise. I would like to see that further explored, but I'm given what the Blueprint said in terms of trying to ramp up the program and figuring out how to um, enhance that, I'm, I'm willing and interested in giving them the opportunity to, to try that out. Um, I I would want us to check back in um, at some point with them to to understand how that's going and whether we should in the future consider something like adding that to another round of EHB. Um, I'm less sanguine about the process of looking at other states' benefits and or partial benefits because, quite frankly, I think there's a lot of uh, distress that occurs in the consumer and the Vermonter community when you start switching up people's benefits. Um, and quite frankly, the what even if we took another state's plan, it would we still have a couple dozen benefit mandates on the books uh, in state law. So those those plans would have to be enhanced with our existing state benefits. So it, I just, I don't see as much opportunity as you do, Tom, given the federal framework, but um, I do think it's important to look at the, the diabetes prevention program, because to your point, it is, um, it, it's really a, a good way to move forward with healthcare reform and ensuring that we have, we're funding prevention appropriately. Uh, so that's where I am. Thank you, Robin. Are there other board member comments or questions? If I can just respond to that a little bit. I, I, I hope I didn't imply or suggest or state that we should look at adopting some other state's plan. Um, my point in, in saying that is that, that that's one of the three 
uh, paths that CMS laid out for us, and that, that's just what it is. I'm not I'm not saying throw our plan plan out and adopt somebody else. In terms of of the benchmark um, and in term of uh, the blueprint plan, um, my th one thought that I had is that that if a benefit plan our benefit plan is paying for prediabetes as a benefit. Not only would the blueprint be a provider, but it might encourage other people out there in the community to be a provider. Um, again, the the blueprint is a is is small. As um, their annual report for nineteen uh, for twenty nineteen showed, they only had one hundred and eighty one people that uh, passed through there. And if you uh, just do some quick math here and say that the QHP population is 31,300, and 9% of, of them are diabetic, which is the statewide all pair bottle uh, average, 9%, that's 2,820 diabetics covered by the benchmark plan. That's of a scale entirely outside the scope of the blueprint. And um, so this is a situation where my think was, build it and they will come. If we allow this as a benefit, then people maybe like Rehab Gym or others would say, OK, well, here, here's now an opportunity uh, where we can make some money, but but uh, not not do it at the uh, the cost, which is, uh, you know, for diabetes treatment, which is I've you know talked to you about Joe's type two diabetes at fifty six hundred as a uh, insurer expense and twenty two. $2,290 out of pocket. So it's, it's, there's this, a lot of money being spent in diabetes. And I just think we're, we're, we've got to build the bridge to, to, to draw that down and build it up somewhere else. Other board comments or questions? This is Tom Walsh. Um, just to um, build on some of what Tom has said. Um, with diabetes, there's a very important component of self-care for that, which is eating. And eating requires teeth. I think we've missed an opportunity to explore ways uh, to incorporate a dental benefit. I've been new to this process, um, but it's been a little bit disappointing to me that given a once in a decade opportunity, there's only been small, uh, a relatively small change. Um, hearing aids are important. The research behind why they're important for every argument, there is a similar argument with greater research support um, for better dental care. It helps with mood, it helps with social interaction, it helps with jobs, um, it helps take care of yourself because you can eat better. And I just, I, it's been, um, I think Tom's comment about a minimal, um, a, a minimalist approach um, struck me as being um, an apt description. And I wish we would have, uh, I wish I could have figured out more of a way to forward uh, better dental coverage for Vermonters. Other board comments or questions? Yeah, hi, Kevin. For some reason, I just want to apologize. I have been trying to get my camera to turn on, and then for some reason, it is not working. So I apologize. I may uh, log off and log back on after we discuss this. But um, anyway, my apologies for that. I'm not sure what the technical issue is there. But I wanted to say that I, I definitely am supportive of Diva's recommendations on the benchmark plan, including uh, adding the hearing aid coverage. Uh, I think it's a small price to pay to improve the quality of life for thousands of Vermonters. Uh, I share some of the concerns of other board members, you know, wishing we could have gone further to think about uh, pre-diabetes work and, and dental coverage and all of that. So I, I share some of those concerns, but in the end, I'm supportive of the recommendations by Diva. Here. Other board comments or questions? Just in response to Tom Walsh, I don't I totally agree with you that dental is is very important, but it's not allowed to be an EHB. So it is a separate process and would require in potentially a legislative appropriation. So I think for me, um, you know, I think that that process um, really needs to be a legislative process because there is the potential for the state appropriation needing to support that coverage for all folks in the individual and small group market and that's 
Um, I don't know how much that would cost, but I imagine it's not insignificant. I, I appreciate the, the comment, Robin, and that's what I've come to learn is that there's really, there's a lot of regulations around us regulators and what we can do and how we can do it. Um, and I've come to see that really to, to get movement on that issue really requires leg legislative action. Um, I appreciate that. I did want to be on the record as um, bringing it up as an important issue to Vermonters, and I hope that um, I hope that gets heard. Tom, I can tell you that it's uh, been spoken about and heard for decades, and no action has been taken. And um, just like a Vermonter can't really um, have the best health without good teeth, um, it's hard to get a job, it, it's a number of different things. And the same goes for vision. And yet, um, despite uh, a lot of conversations for decades, um, no progress has been made. But for us to try to do that, um, it can't happen. And the reality is, is that we're stuck within the actuarial um, values of the different uh, metal levels. And I totally agree with what Tom Pelham said, because I think that this board has absolutely got to find a way to push prevention programs that would result in health savings to the Vermont system. Tom is absolutely right on this. He's been talking about it ever since he first came on the board, and yet uh, no progress has been made. And um, I agree with him completely that whether it doesn't matter what the, the chronic illness that we're trying to prevent, there there's so much savings that could occur. And that was the true hope that I had with the all-payer model, that there would be so much more focus on prevention. And um, as Tom has aptly pointed out, whether it's, it's um, the all-payer model or the blueprint or what have you, the numbers are small. And we have not seen a cross-population movement towards these type of programs, which really could have a major impact on the population of Vermonters. So I just want to uh, thank Tom for continually bringing that forward and uh, just say that it's very frustrating to have been here for five years now and not see the movement that we had all hoped was going to happen on prevention and wellness. Um, with that being said, is there any further board comment or question before I open it up for public comment? Okay, I'm gonna open it up for public comment. Would any member of the public wish to comment on the Essential Health Benefits Benchmark Plan? And the first hand I see is Dale, Dale. Hi, so I, it's more of a clarifying question. The real problem is the AB. We can't really add, I mean, there's lots of the regulations. I, I get that too. But I mean, you, you can't add a vision benefit. You can't add a dental benefit. You can't, I see Robin shaking her head. I think she knows where I'm going, that means. Yeah, Dale, the legal impediment is not in this instance, the AV because the AV is a percentage of the total cost of whatever the benefit package is. It's it's the requirements around how states can choose an essential health benefit and what is or isn't included there. Okay. But it's still driven by the Federal Affordable Care Act requirements. There's always a roadblock, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. And, and that roadblock is very, very frustrating for everyone. And I'm going to talk about this later in the meeting, but I will bring up that um, this is going to be an extremely tough year, and I will very much worry about the affordability of commercial insurance and where we're headed. Um, with that being said, I still believe that Vermonters need the proper benefits, and I think that uh, hearing is part of that. I see another hand, Mike Fisher. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Board. I just want to very briefly uh, uh, echo what I just heard from a couple of board members. Uh, we we sat on the uh, EHB affordability uh, EHB uh, work group, uh, expressed uh, as strong a support for uh, considering and uh, and doing what we could on dental, um, and ran into that same roadblock that's been recognized here. Um, and so, um, having said that and recognize the challenges that we have uh, and, and, and will continue to advocate for improved dental access in the legislature, there are some details that have happened recently that, that could be noted, some modest improvements. Um, but um, I would join in supporting the DIVA recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Is there other public comment? Hearing none, is there a board member prepared to make a motion? I can go ahead and move, make a motion. Um, so I move that for plan year 2024, uh, that the board approve DIVA's February 16th, 2022 recommendation to create a new benchmark plan, including the existing benefits within the Blue Cross Blue Shield CDHP HMO plan and add hearing aid coverage for up to one hearing aid per year every three years and an annual exam. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved by Robin and seconded by Tom Walsh. Is there further board discussion? No luck with the camera, Jess? No, I can't seem to get it to turn on. Sorry, I apologize for that. I suspect I'm going to have to reboot my whole computer and that might take too long. So I'm just going to be camera free today. I apologize. No worries. Just speak up if uh, I don't call on you when you wish to speak. So <laughs> um, with that, um, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion passed unanimously. And Kevin, before we move on, I was going to suggest it sounds like we have some general support for the concept of um, further exploring diabetes prevention um, for the future. And I wonder if I know Tom Pelham, you said you were going to do a concurrence, but perhaps we can find some common language to incorporate it into the decision. It would not be binding since it is not part of the motion, but it would be certainly in, indicative of uh, sort of what met, set of, several of us have expressed in terms of uh, wanting to promote that program. So if so, I wanted to make that suggestion. Um, I think that's an excellent idea, Robin. And I just want to say, Tom, that if we're not able to come up with uh, some good language, I'd be happy I'd be to happy find it your parents. I was wanted to express my desire to do that as well, Tom. I'm happy to join that concurrence. As soon as we but have three we or just, more, it's no like, longer a concurrence. <laughs> we'll get the right language. Well, I, there's going to be a concurrence, but it can also be uh, cut and pasted into into a decision. Parts of it. Perfect. OK, at this point, we're going to change our focus. And we're going to turn to a discussion of thresholds for certificate of need. As you know, um, we have dollar limits um, that uh, are the triggers for when someone needs to seek a certificate of need. And of course, there is that nasty thing called inflation that comes along. And sometimes those limits have to be raised. We have the ability to raise them within the, the inflationary limits. And so I'm going to turn the meeting over to Mike Barber, our general counsel for a discussion on that and what our legal options are. Mike. Are you there, Mike? I'm I'm here. Uh, can you see the presentation? We can. OK, well, I think you covered the first couple of slides, but um, so <laughs> in about <laughs> CON dollar thresholds. Um, there are a number of uh, what we call jurisdictional triggers 
for CON. Um, only some of them have dollar values attached to them. Um, so, for example, construction of an ambulatory surgical center, regardless of cost, uh, requires review. But I've tried to set set out um, the ones with dollar figures uh, on on this slide and the next. So. Um, more often than not, the, the dollar thresholds differ um, between hospitals and other types of healthcare facilities, with hospitals having the higher thresholds, obviously. So as you can see here, um, uh, kind of the first first one is generally I'll refer to as capital cost. Uh, so for hospitals, it's $3 million. Non-hospitals, $1.5 million. Um, the next category here, uh, I'll just refer to this as, as equipment cost from here on. Um, 1.5 million for hospitals, 1 million for non-hospitals, and then um, offering of a new healthcare service or technology. Um, the trigger there is operating expense. So for hospitals, it's 1 million. For non-hospitals, it's 500,000. And I think I'll refer to that as uh, either new service or operating uh, expense going forward. Um, conceptual CON triggers have their own dollar threshold, so it's not different for hospitals and non-hospitals on the conceptual CON, that's $30 million. And then there is a, I've never seen it come into play, but there is an exclusion for expenditures um, up to a certain amount that are made by a healthcare facility in preparation for obtaining a conceptual CON. That is three million for hospitals, one and a half for non-hospitals. Um, <clears throat> as you, you know, think about this, uh, it, just keep in mind that there is a significant exclusion from the CON laws. Uh, we refer to it as the physician's office exemption or exclusion. Uh, although it covers more than just physicians' offices, it, it's the offices of physicians, dentists, and other practitioners of the healing arts, uh, meaning the physical places occupied by such providers on a regular basis in which such providers perform the range of diagnostic and, or and treatment services usually performed by such providers on an outpatient basis. And, um, you know, in the context of the wait times discussion, most independent specialist practices would likely fall under this exception. Um, there are two exceptions to the uh, exclusion uh, to be aware of. First, uh, it doesn't apply to offices owned, operated, or leased by a hospital um, or a hospital subsidiary or parent. And it doesn't apply to certain types of facilities, such as a you know, ambulatory surgery center, diagnostic imaging facility, and so on. Uh, and then <clears throat> it doesn't apply to uh, projects that are subject to review under 18 VSA 9434A4, which is the equipment uh, equipment category for non-hospitals. So that's um, equipment costs exceeding $1 million. So as you said, Mr. Chair, uh, the board has the authority to adjust the monetary thresholds. Um, in doing so, you, you can't change the categories of, you know, the types of things that are subject to review um, and you are limited uh, to adjusting by an amount that does not exceed the uh, cumulative consumer price index rate of inflation. Uh, this slide is just showing you the the history, the statutory history for for that statute. Um, it's just interesting that it dates back to 2005. Uh, well, 2003 legislation effective uh, beginning of 2005. Obviously, before the board was established, um, it used to specify that adjustments had to be done by rulemaking and and could not exceed the, the CPI rate of inflation. And then in 2018, uh, the requirement that the adjustments be made by rule was eliminated and um, the language was changed to say that the adjustments 
could not exceed the cumulative CPI rate of inflation. And then this slide is just showing you uh, the last time each of those uh, dollar thresholds was last adjusted. Um, and as you saw there, uh, the, the hospital um, hospital equipment and uh, new service thresholds were adjusted effective July 1st, 2018. Um, so uh, B2 and B3 here. Um, looking back at the legislative history, it, it appears that these were adjusted to uh, nationwide median values based on a 2016 report that looked uh, at at the 35 or so states that have CON programs and what their thresholds are. Um, the capital hospital capital expense threshold of three million was not adjusted at that time because uh, it was in line with the national median. Um, I was not involved in that, but that is what I could gather from from the documents that I reviewed. Um, so moving on to the approach we took here, um, there's really two kind of questions we had to sort out. The first and probably most important one was where, where do you start from when calculating cumulative CPI? Uh, we decided to start from July 1st, 2018, because uh, it appears that all of the dollar thresholds were evaluated at this time. And as I just talked about, the two of the hospital thresholds were increased. Um, and then the second issue we had to figure out was which CPI to use. There's multiple uh, CPI measures. Um, so we we calculated growth from July 1st, 2018 using uh, CPIU all items, all cities and CPIU medical care, all cities. Uh, CPIU all items is a measurement of change in a um, variety of different consumer goods and services so transportation, food, medical care and, and other things. Um, and it's probably what most people would think of when they think of CPI. Um, CPIU medical care is a sub-index for medical care. Obviously, that it measures changes in total reimbursement to medical care providers. So we we <clears throat> uh, looked at both of those just to give you a sense for 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 where they differed. Um, CPIU medical care, if you if you look back, uh, you know, we went back to the 2005, it has grown faster than CPIU all items, but that is not the case from the time period we were measuring. So July 8, 2018 to the present, CPIU all items has grown faster. Um, we did look at the numbers uh, just for the the North or New England states rather. Um, but we didn't present that here. I can share that in the future if you'd like. Um, but this range was giving you the most kind of discretion it, up to this. The highest growth rate we found was this 12.18%, I guess. <clears throat> so moving on to the calculations. Uh, these are the calculations for the hospital thresholds, um, so how, showing you how much you could raise those thresholds uh, under the approach that we took. And then these are the non-hospital calculations. And then these are the conceptual CON calculations. And I can come back to those um, if you would like. Uh, but we also tried to give you some data on, um, you know, what what kinds of projects are these thresholds 
bringing in or not bringing in, uh, you know, if if you're trying to figure out whether they're over inclusive or not, um, we thought it might be helpful to just give you a sense of that. So this slide is showing how many uh, CONs were issued each year from 2018 through 2021 and how many no jurisdiction letters were issued for each of those years. So for 2018, issued seven CONs, 2019, five CONs, 2020, five CONs, 2021, six CONs. In comparison, in 2018, we uh, issued 19 no jurisdiction letters. In 2019, we issued eight. In 2020, we issued four. And in 2021, we issued 10. Um, the next few slides here are giving you uh, more detail on uh, the projects that were approved by the board in these years. Um, tried to briefly uh, describe <clears throat> what the project involved, who was the applicant, why it was subject to review, so what CON uh, trigger it tripped, um, and how long uh, it took the board to review the application and issue a decision. So I won't go through them all. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention on uh, this slide back here is that these, these numbers do not include um, project changes. So for example, EVMMC's EPIC expansion to New York hospitals or uh, the Green Mountain Surgery Center uh, case from I think it was 2019. The, those are not included in these numbers, but I have noted them on uh, these slides here. So I won't, like I said, I won't go through these individually. Uh, we'll just kind of skip to um, the next segment here. So this is just providing you more detail on the review process and giving you the context for some of those numbers on the prior slides. As you know, the board has 90 days to review and close a CON application. Um, the time during which an applicant is responding to requests for information are not counted in calculating uh, that time period. The board has to make a decision on an application within 120 days after the application closes. Um, Expedited review is available for certain types of projects and expedited review process does away with the need for a hearing and allows the board to issue a, a CON um, quickly if it is satisfied it has enough information to do so. Uh, so for the projects approved by the board between 2018 and 2021, the board granted uh, 16 requests for expedited review and denied two requests. And even when you include uh, the EPIC project uh, in 2018, which had a abnormally long review period, it took the board an average of 53 days to close an application, and it took an average of 40 days from the time of closure to issue a CON. That those numbers obviously don't give you the, the whole picture in terms of how long the process uh, takes uh, because it doesn't include the time it took the applicant to respond to questions. That does vary considerably based on uh, just the quality and um, completeness of an application and the issues involved. So um, you know, we don't so that so those are the internal numbers. Uh, we did try to look for some external numbers. Um, we don't have an updated version of that 2016 study that I mentioned that informed the 2018 statutory revisions. Uh, but we did have time to take a quick look at least at the other uh, states in New England to see where they were at in terms of dollar thresholds. So that's. Uh, presented on the next couple of slides. So as you'll see here, Rhode Island, another small state has <clears throat> thresholds of uh, 6.2 million for construction or innovation, 2.6 million for equipment, 
and 1.8 million in operating costs for new services. Uh, Massachusetts, uh, the thresholds are not terribly different from here. Uh, we've got 1.1 million for equipment and 2.3 for other expenditures. Uh, the hospital thresholds obviously are quite quite a bit higher, <laughs> which is uh, not surprising given uh, just the size of some of their hospital systems. Um, we took a look at Maine. <clears throat> uh, these are the thresholds in Maine. I, I, if you have questions about how the, these are applied, I'd have to take that back. I, I don't won't pretend to know how you know how each of these is is defined uh, at this point. But I, if you have questions, I could certainly dig into that. Um, and then Connecticut uh, does not have dollar thresholds. Uh, review is triggered by the nature of the project. Um, interestingly, they require a CON for termination of certain types of services, which uh, was interesting to see. And that is what we prepared for you. Um, happy to answer questions or if you'd like additional data uh, at a subsequent meeting, I can come back with, with more data. Thank you, Mike. Uh, the comparative uh, analysis between the states is helpful, but uh, we are limited to what we can do as a board based on, um, my lights are flickering here, based, based on the inflationary uh, um, limitations and I was curious if you had a recommendation um, one on whether or not uh, they should be increased and two which um, inflationary measure you would recommend no I didn't prepare a recommendation but I'm happy to come back with one if that would be something you want okay um, I think at the minimum these should be increased to uh, reflect the, the inflationary increases. And in fact, I think that we're in a period now where um, inflation is going to um, accelerate. And we've already seen that in existing CONs that have had to come back in um, because the, the cost of their projects uh, has increased. So um, the main question is whether or not um, we believe our statutory uh, authority is enough or if we should be seeking um, uh, additional um, help from a legislative change that would allow to go beyond that. Um, I'm content with just the inflationary increase, but I'm really curious on what other board members are thinking. Other Hi, board this members? Is, Robin? I agree we should be looking at um, an increase for inflation. Uh, personally, I would probably go with the CPIU all items um, because it has been a number of years since any changes have been made. And to your point, Kevin, about this year's inflation, um, but I'm interested in hearing from stakeholders. So I'm hoping we can open a public comment period as we normally would do. Um, I yeah, was no action involved. is required today. We have time. Great. Um, I was involved in the 2017 process with Marissa Melamed. We led a stakeholder group to look at changes to the CON program, which did result in a couple of changes, as Mike mentioned, to thresholds, but bigger changes related to um, the nursing home jurisdiction, which was discontinued. So, um, you know, I think certainly if there is stakeholder interest in another process, uh, we could do that. I would prefer not to be the person to do that <laughs> this time around. Somebody else can have a shot at it. Um, but uh, for me, I'm good with looking at, I do think we should do something and I'm interested to hear from stakeholders about uh, the inflation and whether that's sufficient Robin, we probably would be doing everyone a disservice if we didn't use your valuable historical knowledge. You like to give me the stakeholder process, I know. 
<laughs> Other board comments or questions? Um, I'm a little confused here. L looking back at the chart of when these things were last examined, you know, uh, I see the equipment threshold and the operating budget thresholds 2018. But on that list, it had hospital capital, I thought, at 2003. Yeah, I don't think that three million has changed, has it, uh, Mike? No, that was the last. So uh, the last effective date for the change was um, July 1st, 2003. Yep. So that is a change in the statute. Um, but uh, as a in the stakeholder process in 2017, my recollection is we were looking at thresholds across the board. So this doesn't reflect that there was a process that might have happened. It only reflects whether or not it re that process resulted in a statutory change. That's true. So like I said on the next slide, I think all the hospital, I think all, like Robin said, all the thresholds were evaluated. Uh, it looks like with respect to the hospital capital expense threshold, it was in line with uh, what was then the median of 3 million amongst uh, the states that have CON programs. And so I think the decision was not to change that at that time. So Mike, the follow-up question that I have to that is, um, if that hasn't changed since 2003 and um, was not changed in 2017-2018 uh, statutory change period, does the board have the authority to do an inflationary increase dating back to 2003, or are we limited to um, starting with the 2017 period? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, something that we wrestled with, and I can come back and uh, talk to you specifically about that, um, but I didn't prepare for that today. Okay, we'll we'll plan on having you back. Tom Walsh, I see your hand up. Yes, thank you, Chair, and, and uh, thank you, Mike. Um, this may be more of just a, a question helping me to understand the um, the link between the length of time that we take to review certificate of need applications and the changes that we're discussing with um, the uh, due to inflation or otherwise. I'm wondering if um, someone could just help me understand that if we're if we make a change or don't, um, would we anticipate that speeding up or slowing down the process um, as you outlined it? Yeah, it's hard to say. Um, you know, I could see that if we increase the thresholds significantly, um, and these are not too significant of changes we're talking about here. Um, if they were increased significantly, you could, uh, maybe we wouldn't be reviewing more simple ones and just be reviewing complex ones and that would increase the time. I, it's, t it's but it, that's just kind of speculation. I, it's tough to say. Okay, um, that's helpful. I'll, I'll keep, um thinking and um, if you do come back maybe we could explore that a little bit further just the pros and cons of what this might do to our um the efficiency w through which certificate of needs go make their way through the board and i think that uh, the problem with your your question tom is that it would depend on how many cons came in in any time period that the staff has to deal with. And so that affects things and the complexity of the request affects things. And um, I think that basically, at least in my mind, what this discussion is within our existing authority is just not taking on additional projects that would not have met the threshold five years ago um, but that that would meet it today because of the inflationary pressures that are, are seen. So um, I don't think it does anything truly to speed things up 
other than if it truly limited and based on the dollar values that I've been seeing, I don't see it being truly limiting. That, that's helpful. Uh, thank you both. Other board members questions or comments? Yeah, Kevin, can you hear me? Sorry that you still can. can't. Go ahead. OK, and again, my apologies for my camera. Um, so this is hugely helpful, Mike, and I really appreciate it. Uh, I, I would support adjusting the thresholds. I think there have been significant inflationary pressures that should be accounted for in these uh, triggers. I have a couple of questions. Um, I guess one would be if we did round, I mean, if we did uh, adjust the thresholds, one of the questions I would have is would we use actually these dollar amounts as computed or would we round down? I know that we can't round up, I think, because the statutory language says that we ha are limited by um, the CPI adjustment. So rounding up would probably exceed that. So I guess that's one question. Would we uh, round down or would we accept uh, these you know, numbers as computed? So maybe I'll let you answer that question, then I'll go on to another one. I think that's a question for your fellow board members. You could do either. Okay. Or keep the... That would be up to us. <laughs> okay. Um, and then in terms of, um, you know, thinking about the timeline, and I'm, you know, I know that part of the, you know, the lengthy timeline in many instances is the disparity in the quality of the applications that are submitted. And I'm just wondering, could we consider, is there ability to consider starting the CON clock when the staff determines that the application is complete? Because I think some of that, you know, they submit the application, but then it's incomplete and there's a lot of back and forth. I mean, could we just start the time clock and say, it's not complete yet, here you go. And when it's actually deemed complete, that's when the clock starts. Is that something that we have the ability to do? I don't think so. Uh, not the way the statute is written. So the, I believe the statute starts the time from the application receipt and um, we have 90 days to, uh, to, to close it um, or to say that, you know, despite it's not being complete, we're going to we're going to continue. Um, I can come back and, and give you some more <laughs> uh, reasoned thoughts on that, but I, I don't think that's possible given the statute that we have. OK, well, I guess one of the things if we're going to like parking lot ideas <laughs> um, and and maybe a parking lot idea could be to make a recommendation at some point to the legislature around just adding some language that would allow the time, you know, the clock to start when the application is deemed complete. So. It might require just a minor adjustment to statutory language. I'm not sure if that counts as a technical change or what, but no, it doesn't. Robin's saying no. Um, but to me, it's it's actually kind of a big change um, because of the culture that the board, and quite frankly, before the board, Vishka has developed around CON, which is that the staff try to helpfully uh, work with the applicant to complete the application and. I, I mean, to me, that seems like it's a small wording change, but it's kind of a big process shift. Well, I guess I'm not suggesting that the staff not help the applicant. I'm just suggesting that the clock doesn't start until the application is complete. So I wouldn't, you know, I would still expect our staff to help applicants understand what a complete application looks like and help them through that. But I'm just sort of thinking, why not start the time clock when that application actually is completely complete? But anyway, we can, if, if it doesn't sound like that's a possibility, then I guess that's not a possibility. But maybe, Mike, if you can look into it a little bit and Robin think about it. I think yeah. it's a possibility. I just wouldn't call it technical. Okay. And I would say that there there is currently a, a t there's, so there's two clocks, right? There's the 90 day clock and then there's the 120 day clock. And what you're talking about is the 120 day clock. So once we close an application, once it's, complete, we have 120 days to issue a decision. Um, and I just want to say that uh, the board's policy has always been in my time here to try to 
help the applicants as much as possible, to try to be as expeditious as possible, and never just um, worry about being within time limits, but to try to deliver a CON in an expeditious but as thorough a manner as possible. And that's something that we continually strive to improve upon. Are there other board comments or questions? I guess I just I just have one kind of further comment or question. Um, it's it's actually more of a comment, and it's a bigger picture comment, um, not to be addressed today, but just maybe again maybe a parking lot thought. Um, you know, I think as we think about what CON laws were designed to do, it's really to reduce you know costly duplication of services and improve quality through making sure that there's regionalization of surgeries and procedures where we know that there's some volume quality relationship and also to reduce the potential for cream skimming of, of private patients that might um, you know jeopardize the facilities that disproportionately serve uh, for example Medicaid or uninsured patients and I think and if you look at the, the academic literature which is pretty extensive on this topic there's mixed results in CON effectiveness and I think despite noble intentions CON laws, you know, do restrict competition. They protect incumbents, particularly hospitals, have potential to, in some cases, drive up prices and, and stifle innovation, right? So this is what the, the literature sort of suggests and has evidence about. So there's mixed reviews on its effectiveness. And I guess my, my parking lot idea is, as we think about accelerating to more fixed perspective payment and value-based payment, you know, should we also be thinking about the role of CON and how that might evolve, where it's, it, we know we want to evolve that CON process. As providers become more accountable for cost and quality, there's gonna be less incentive for that duply costly, duplicating costly services. And there's gonna be more incentive to ensure that volumes are high enough to maintain quality because of the payment shifts that we're making. So I guess I would just say, I wonder if as we're thinking about our regulatory process that we're evolving um, to be more aligned with value-based payments, should we incorporate how we view CON in there as well? So that's kind of a, just a bigger question that I'm throwing out there. But. Other board comment or questions? Yes, <laughs> this is Tom, <laughs> Tom Walsh. That's my, my comment to uh, Jess's question. I would say, I would also say yes, but um, given that we're talking about five to 10 or maybe five to 15 applications, um, this would not be my personal priority for our staff time focused on regulatory integration. I think hospital budgets and ACO budgets are bigger fishes to fry than CON given the limited number of applications that we get already. So that's not to say it's not important, but we have limited bandwidth and this would not be my number one priority. Other board comments or questions? If not, I'm gonna open it up to the public for comments. And I see Dale's hand raised. Dale. Yeah, first I have to say, Tom, Tom, I can relate to the um, hearing aids. Mine broke. They were broke for two weeks. Then they spent a week in repair. I was lost. Um, it, it was really rough. Anyways, on to um, the... I'm, I'm giving away my age here. I've seen, lived through rates of high inflation or actually I also called it fast inflation because it's not always the magnitude, it's the pace of the inflation and what they're describing, I believe, is a fast pace inflation. And what I remember happening is projects would come in with an estimated cost and right as they were considering it, it was already out of sync to what the actual cost was going to be. So some some of the things that they did is they would pad the budget so that it, it would say if inflation goes to the point where it's going to cost more than this, 
to complete the project. It has to be reevaluated. Um, the other thing that became a factor is lead time for delivery of supplies because that would literally determine what the actual cost was going to be of the product. So if you've got a high rate of inflation happening rapidly and they suddenly say, we can't get this to you for six months, you've got a different cost. So I, I don't know what the board wants to do with this. Jessica's the economist. Um, I, I mean, I, I just want to throw that out there that for anybody that hasn't lived through fast pace inflation, it, it's a slightly different nature in terms of how that works when you're trying to do projections than what we may be used to. Uh, thank you. That was my only comment. Thanks, Dale. And uh, I can relate. Uh, we ordered sliding doors two years ago that were supposed to be in within six months. We're still waiting. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Other public comment. Other public comment. Hearing none, Mike, I think you uh, you know what your homework is. We're, we'd like to have you back. We'd like to have a public comment period opened on the issue. And um, I'll ask Kara to uh, open up that period on our website. And uh, Mike, I don't know what your schedule and the board schedules are, but I'm sure we can coordinate this and get you scheduled either at the next board meeting or one within the next month. OK, thanks, Kevin. And let me just restate what I think my homework is. So you'd like advice on the starting point uh, and whether you have the authority to go back to the last time each specific threshold was last adjusted. Yes, and I heard from a recommendation on the correct uh, uh, measurement of inflation. OK. For what we're regulating. Anything else? I don't think so. OK. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Thanks. Can hey. I also just chime in for one last suggestion? Sure. Could we? I'm just looking at the participant list. I do see the hospital association is here, but some of the other impacted parties are not in attendance. So I'm wondering if we could just do a little outreach to home health and other provider types that would be impacted just to let them know this conversation is happening in case they haven't caught on that we're discussing it. So Mike, perhaps uh, Abigail from the CON team could reach out to, um, I would I would say the uh, organizational parties such as VAS and um, uh, VNAs and uh, so on and so forth. So, Thanks. okay. Is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? And I wanted to bring up an issue that uh, I want to begin the public dialogue on. And it's something that uh, I think uh, is of great concern to um, all Vermonters and especially commercial ratepayers. And we're starting to see um, the effects of what is happening in the workforce um, and healthcare. And we're seeing that not only are we seeing high traveler costs, but in order to um, have equity for Vermonters working in those positions, a few hospitals have already had to offer significant pay raises and retention bonuses. And we're now at the point where at least a couple of the hospitals have come to the board and um, have begun to raise questions about mid-year adjustments. And in one case, have already asked for a mid-year adjustment. And we'll be having that discussion over the next few months. But I think it's important that um, 
I bring it up today under new business because there are further ramifications and that is um, we are in the middle of a legislative session. It's at the halfway point, um, but I just want to make it clear and this is just from one board member. I'm not speaking on behalf of the whole board, but as one board member, I feel it's inappropriate for the increased labor costs affiliated with health care due to the shortage that currently exists of the workforce that um, all that burden gets placed on one subset of Vermonters and that being the commercial ratepayers. And I think it's important that at least I send a message to um, our colleagues both at the federal level and at the state level that um, it doesn't seem right that a population that we've already burdened with over a 40% premium on actual costs of health care be the one population that has to solve all the costs related to the workforce issues in the state. And so um, I just wanted to bring this issue up and maybe other board members um, wish to talk about it as well. Um, but this is something that I feel um, all payers have to come to the table to and this is something that um, must be dealt with um, it's not something that is going to go away quickly we can't bury our heads in the sand because if we did that there's a huge access problem because no longer are there the professionals needed to care for vermonters as they get sick and need health care so um, board members, I'll throw that over to you if anybody else has any uh, comments they wish to make on this, but uh, I ho would hope that we could begin a conversation with government payers to um, try to send a message that this should not just be on the back of a subset of Vermonters. Kevin, it's Jess. Um, I'm wondering, is it worth, could we request a meeting with legislative leaders and um, potentially, you know, folks from the governor's office to, to identify if there's any additional one-time funding that might help or other sources of federal assistance that might um, be tapped into to, to cover this? Is that something that's an that important question, Jess, and I'll just say that uh, I have testified in the legislature and I did a calculation based on the $10 billion that New York State is allocating for healthcare workforce. Um, we're not alone. All the states are spending dollars trying to um, fight this problem. But if you take that um, $10 billion and you divide it out over the 22, I can't remember if it was 22.4 or whatever the population is of New York, I came up with $494 per person, per capita in the state of New York. If we were to use that same figure in Vermont, the dollar amount that would be spent on the healthcare workforce issue would be about $315 million. So much smaller scale than the 10 billion, but still 315 million is a lot of money. And yet when I do the math on what I've heard so far, I'm only seeing about um, a little less than 40 million being spent in Vermont. Um, on the healthcare workforce issue. So um, I brought those issues to um, committees in the legislature, but maybe we should be sending something formally to um, the leaders of both the House and the Senate. And uh, I would hope it could come from the entire board and not just from one board member. I, I would add to that, Kevin, that you, uh, in terms of like getting the governor's office involved and the legislative folks involved, but also the folks at DIVA. Um, rates, rate setting, I mean, I know they're one of our partners and stakeholders, et cetera, but rate setting um, is the vehicle through which the cost shift occurs. And, um, you know, as I've played around with some of the Medicaid numbers, and certainly I'm doing it through binoculars, you know, where if you look at 20, 22 versus 2023 on the emergency board's Medicaid plan, um, the uh, the projected decrease in um, uh, enrollees versus the rate increases for each of the the, the Medicaid eligible segments uh, is a is a is a is a winner from a budget point of view for Diva. Now I don't know if the governor adopted those emergency board numbers, uh, you know, as they flow through, but. I'm just, you know, um, 
a, a little not suspect but just you know that some of the intricacies of how caseloads and pms pms work um um that they they can work to the advantage of of the state budget and to the disadvantage of providers um so i i yeah i i'd like to have a conversation with the diva folks that actually are in the trenches um not necessarily deep in the trenches but you know, are are the folks that you know make these decisions? <clears throat> Kevin, I think the the math that you brought to the meeting you had is very telling, and I think we're um, you know we're maybe starting the process of coming out of the pandemic and it's laid bare um, many issues in healthcare and what you're talking about with. Um, how we support healthcare, the workforce, I think is, um, and what that means to Vermonters who are going to um, have to pay for those changes. I think it's very important and it's a all hands on deck type of thing. So if we as a board can proactively reach out, um, I, I, I just support that. I think that's a really good, uh, really good idea um, and I'd like to be involved be helpful any way I can. Any other comments from the board? I don't really feel like I have anything else uh, to add other than um, I, I know that you have periodic meetings with delegation staff, so I'm sure you've brought the issue up to the congressional delegation. It seems like that's likely to be obviously not a quick solution, but um, would be probably the appropriate venue for the Medicare area. So just th thought I'd throw that out as a thought. It definitely is, and I don't want uh, this to be sounding as negative towards our delegation, because our delegation has done phenomenal work, especially during the pandemic, to bring dollars to Vermont to keep hospitals and other healthcare organizations afloat. And they've done incredible work. And in addition to that, there's the dollars that have flowed to the state that could be used. So um, I, I just want to make sure that um, we don't come across as being ungrateful because we have been the beneficiaries of incredible work done by our, our federal congressional delegation. So. Um, but I do think that Medicare needs to raise reimbursements to more accurately reflect what is the reality. And it's not just a reality here in Vermont, it's a reality across the country. So Kevin, is the next step then maybe to try and convene a meeting, identify who should be at the table and convene a meeting? I think uh, probably the best thing is, um, since Susan's picture is right in front of me, to ask her to um, have staff begin working on a plan on how we move forward with um, communicating out to our governmental partners um, our concerns. Is there other comment from the board? Is there other new business? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. And I just want to uh, uh, remind the board that we do have a discussion on um, CON deliberation that's uh, scheduled for three o'clock and um, I'll see the board then. Thank you.